Thanks, Jean-Francois, and thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've actually seen this work in the formative stages over several years. In fact, I have two maquettes of the Stokaknikons in my office at home, and I twiddle with them all the time and align them up in different formations. So I've had, to, had a little trial run with this work for quite a while now. <coughs> what I wanted to do today was actually position this work um, historically and theoretically with four people who I think are very germane to its underpinnings. And it's interesting that these four people all produced their key works roughly a hundred years ago, as it turns out. Uh, these people are Sigmund Freud, who wrote Interpretation of Dreams, uh, published it in 1900. Henri Bergson, the French philosopher, known for his analysis of memory in particular, which is of course very germane to this work, uh, and produced Matter and Memory, also in 1900. Marcel Proust, who wrote the bulk of A la Recherche du Temps Perdu between roughly 1913 and 1925. He was one of these writers who never stopped revising it. And also, last but not least, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, the Swiss linguist um, who uh, produced his course on general linguistics in 1913. Uh, this was never actually formally published by Saussure because he died before publication and it was actually produced from his students' lecture notes. And it's um, an instance where I often remind my students that if I drop dead tomorrow and we had to reproduce my class from your lecture notes, you better make sure they're accurate. Um, and I wanted to start with Saussure, actually, because I wanted to root Jean-Francois's work in, in particular in uh, the basics of structural linguistics, just to start with, then extend it to issues of memory, bringing in Freud and Bergson and Proust, and then talk a little bit about composite memory from there. So there's a certain logic to how I'm going to progress today. Um, in effect, Saussure is important because he gave us a way to understand the basics of how language is put together. Perhaps one of the most profound statements, if you're a linguistics, is the cat sat on the mat, believe it or not. Why? Well, because the cat sat on the mat is an example of subject, subject predicate sentence structure, which in the West, we use as the basic structure of all of our use of language. The subject is the cat, and sat on the mat is the predicate. What's also interesting about it is that it's an example of a syntagmatic chain of words that when linked together can produce a sentence that makes narrative sense. You've got a subject, the cat, a verb, sat, and then what the, the verb qualifies on the mat. Um, when in, 19, in the late 1920s, Roman Jakobson uh, had left Russia and founded the Prague School of Structural Linguistics, he did an analysis of this kind of sentence structure based on um, what he referred to as language aphasia in pac patients who had difficulty putting sentences together. And he discovered that there were two kinds of aphasia in patients, one of which is what he called a horizontal aphasia. These were people who had a very hard time linking words together to create chains of meaning, not only in, in a sentence, but also going from sentence to sentence, sentence to paragraph, etc., etc. There, there were also those who had vertical aphasia, where these patients had a very, very hard time replacing one word with another in a sentence in order to keep um, a given sense. So in the case of cat sat on the mat, a horizontal aphasia would be someone who had a very hard time going from cat to sat to mat. A vertical aphasia would be someone who would have a very hard time replacing cat with dog or any other word and sat with any other verb like ran or mat with say the kitchen. And it was from these aphasias that Jakobson, building on Saussure, discovered that all structural language had a vertical and horizontal axis that worked in tandem with each other. 
So the cat sat on the mat then gives rise to all kinds of substitute possibilities. The horse bolted out of the stable, an obvious example, through substitution. But then you could also add on and then ran into the field, jumped the farmer's fence and ran into the city. And then you could just keep building on that sentence endlessly if you wanted to. So right there in terms of the, the absolute origins of structural linguistics, you've got the fundamentals of addition and what, that's what we call a syntagm and substitution, what we call paradigm. And in, if you w work with Jean-Francois's pieces here, you can see that in many respects by changing the parameters of how the images link up with each other, you are in effect playing with structural linguistics. You've got a horizontal axis where you can create chains of meaning from image to image to image, but you can also substitute new images like paradigm shifts. Replace cat with dog, for example. So right from the get-go, the very fundamentals of these pieces are predicated on how language works. It's only then a very short step to move from that to having it not just be about language and words, but also about memories. And most memories are laid down in image form. So it's actually far more pertinent to image structure in many respects. Um, the other key factor, and this is where Freud and, and Bergson come into play, is that Fran Jean-Francois has, has organized these pieces in effect as machines, as apparatuses. They function like machines. You turn handles so that you generate different image combinations. You can produce them, deconstruct them, revise them accordingly, in very much the same way that a machine can produce more input to generate different output. Now this input-output machine and system that Jean-Francois is playing with here is absolutely fundamental to how both Freud and Bergson described how memory is formed and how memory is the absolute motor of human activity. Um, if you read chapter 7 of Freud's interpretation of dreams, which up until chapter 7 is an incredibly readable book and actually very entertaining. Uh, there's nothing better than reading about people's neuroses and hang-ups and, and, and following the mystery of what's caused them and then what could possibly cure them. And you're going, when, while you're reading it, wow, I can't believe Freud is such a great easy read. Then you hit chapter 7, which is unbelievably difficult. But what's interesting about chapter 7 is that Freud, for the first time, introduces an illustration into the text. And what it is, is an illustration of the psyche in the form of a machine. And the form that it takes is, as I said earlier, an input-output machine. So what you get is input coming from the everyday world in towards the human body. That input is received by the body and laid down as a memory trace in much the same way that Jean-Francois is laying down these images as memory traces. These memory traces are laid down in absolute discrete form. In fact, Freud describes it like pieces of tracing paper laid one on top of the other so that the actual memory is left undisturbed forever. And you could, in theory at least, access each memory exactly the way that they were first laid down when they, when they first entered the machine, as it were. Then, over time, these memory traces are laid down so that all future input into the machine is greeted by one of these memories and then turned into an appropriate response. And this is where Berkson comes into play because Berkson's theory of memory is very, very similar to Freud's. He, his is, a, is a, a, a motor machine of input-output also. But what Berkson argues is that the, these, this agglomeration of bits of tracing paper, what he calls an aggregate of memory images, is a giant totality 
but we never draw on all of it at any given time in order to produce an appropriate motor response to incoming input. We draw on the one that's absolutely necessary to generate the appropriate response and ignore the rest. We, in fact, edit out probably 99.9999% of all of our memories, and we just select the one that's needed for, for the given action. Now, in the classroom, I like to illustrate this by picking up the blackboard eraser, which always sends me back to the memory of my own high school uh, and, and dealing with the teachers who were deadly with their blackboard eraser aim. And I pick it up and I aim it at one of the students and pretend to throw it across the room at them. And I say, OK, this is input. What is your memory machine going to do when they see this blackboard eraser flying right at your head? Right? And, well, unless you're David Beckham or, or um, Messi and you're going to head it in the goal, you duck without even thinking because your motor response is selecting the appropriate memory out of that entire aggregate of memories to create the appropriate motor action so you don't get hurt, right? So in effect then, every time we act, every time we draw on our memories, we in effect reduce from the aggregate and it's really a question of, of uh, subtraction rather than addition in order to get appropriate um, action. And sure enough, my student always ducks, and I go, voila, see? And then I illustrate it in some other way. However, more often than not, if we don't have a specific action in mind, if we, if we are kind of musing or daydreaming or driving along and, and, and getting lost in our thoughts, and we activate memories, if they don't have a particular mode or action in mind, what we tend to do is we draw on memories as agglomerations of memories, what Jean-Francois in his work calls composite memories. And these composites are no longer discrete, they're often combinations, and they're also memories where you can't quite pinpoint when they were laid down. They're much more muddied. So there's very, very few examples of a pure memory that you remember exactly as it happened. It's more often than not clouded by other memories that are similar to it that have generated different motor responses in the past. That's why, we, for example, when you go on vacation or go back to your hometown to revisit something, and you kind of recall when you're walking down your old high school corridor what it was like back then, as it were, you never really remember a singular instance. You maybe remember 50 to 100 combinations, composite memories of instances that have all melted together. And this is, in many ways, is the very stuff of how art uses memory instead of how we use memory to get actions done on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay?